It is a foggy September Thursday morning and traffic is flying along the A249 over the Sheppey Crossing. The road is a main artery for some 40,000 inhabitants on the Isle of Sheppey to the rest of Kent. The bridge the traffic today is flowing over is one of two road links in the area and can be deadly in poor weather. This was the case on the 5th of September. A thick fog had descended upon the Sheppey Crossing. Visibility for the cars on the bridge was not far beyond the bonnet, which common sense would dictate to maybe slow down. But for many drivers, getting to their destination quicker was more important. At around 7.15, a car crash initiated a 10 minute long pileup, where a seemingly endless number of crashes, bumps and shunts would bring the crossing into national news and would not only show the stupidity of the drivers, but also a few inherent design flaws of the bridge, which was at the time still fairly new. Background. It is 2006, and a new bridge is being unveiled as part of a multi-million pound improvement project modernising a vital link between the town of Sheerness and the M20 motorway. The Isle of Sheppey throughout its history has suffered from connection issues to the rest of the Kent County region. This is due to the island being surrounded by the Thames estuary to its north and to the south the Swale Channel. This part is closest to the rest of Kent and is also a vast marshland. Oh yes and it's around here on a map. In the UK roads that connect population centres are divided into three categories. Motorways which are large multi-lane routes that connects regions. A roads which connects towns and villages. These can be multi-lane or just one lane in each direction. And B roads which are minor roads that connect smaller settlements. All of these types are numbered and the route that connects the M20 motorway and Sheerness is called the A249. Sheerness is a vital financial centre for the island due to its port. It is one of the largest foreign car importers in the UK, as well as handling thousands of tonnes of fruits and meat products from all over the world. As such, road links are vital to the area, but before 2006, the island's main trunk route had one hell of a pinch point, the King's Ferry Bridge. The Swell Channel which Kings Ferry and the 2006 crossing bridges span is used as a shipping route, which would require a bridge design to account for this. The Kings Ferry was a lift bridge design, which carried the roadway and a single track rail line. Now this is fine and all, but for one thing, around 30,000 vehicles used the crossing per day, and up to 20 ships navigate along the swale every day as well. Which means traffic had to be stopped to raise the deck and allow a vessel to pass underneath. And this took roughly 20 minutes to complete. Not something ideal for a major trunk route. As such, a new £20 million bridge was commissioned. Instead of a lift bridge, the new crossing would be built tall enough to allow ships underneath without stopping the flow of traffic. It would be around a mile long, have two lanes in each direction, no street lighting and no refuse points or hard shoulder. The two directions were separated by a central barrier. Initially a tunnel was considered, but the local wildlife impact put an end to the plan and thus a bridge was conceived. Great you might think, but this came with a new added problem. Because of the steep gradient needed to get the required height over the swale estuary, vehicular traffic making their way over the bridge are unable to see the summit. This opens the risk of accidents as any incident beyond the summit can't be seen by vehicles approaching the crossing. To add more visibility issues the roadway was unlit meaning problems in weather conditions such as heavy rain, mist or fog. The latter was a common sight on the Sheppey crossing as the surrounding area was marshland, a breeding ground for fog. But I digress. The new bridge was opened in July 2006 and proved to be a vital addition to the island's transport infrastructure. The earlier Kingsbury Bridge remained, giving an alternate route and access to Swale train station. The disaster, cars kept on coming. It is the morning of the 5th of September 2013. A thick fog had descended upon Sheppey 
and the crossing over the swale. Visibility was less than 20 metres. Many were seen driving at or even in some cases in excess of the 70 mile an hour limit, which is pretty common for normal weather conditions, but with the fog obscuring the road ahead, combined with the steep gradient of the bridge, driving at the speed limit was just reckless. At around 7.14am, two cars and a van made contact with one another, and with no hard shoulder to pull into, they partially blocked the carriageway. Some traffic were able to react in time and swerve the crash. The fog, now with visibility of less than a metre in some places, were blind following vehicles. Witnesses saw car after car disappear into the fog, only to be followed shortly by the sounds of screeching and crashes. Many cars did not put on their fog lights. As a side note for all you non-Brits, here's a quick mention about fog lights. In the UK, it is a legal requirement for all cars to have one rear red high intensity fog light. Many cars have front fog lights as well, but they aren't a legal requirement. But although legally required on UK cars, many rarely use them. My personal theory is that, ironically, it's illegal to use them when there isn't any fog, because it can dazzle other road users. As such, many just don't bother altogether. Here's a little annoying experiment you can try. Ask someone you know to show you where their rear fog light switch is. I reckon around 70% wouldn't know. With several cars and vans now in a mangled mess, countless numbers of following cars, trucks and vans continued rear-ending more and more stranded smashed up vehicles. The first 999 calls came into the emergency call centre, all whilst the cars continued to pile up. Here's a little snippet of the audio recording of one of those calls. Crash cars backed all the way along the southbound carriage, over the summit and onto the approach section of the bridge. After roughly 10 minutes of the sounds of crashes, tyre screeches and crunches, it was mainly over and upwards of 130 vehicles were damaged with tens more stranded. But minor shunts would still continue even after the police had arrived. Anyone who could got out of their damaged vehicles and started wandering around. Rescue and recovery brought a whole other level of logistical issues. The sheer weight of vehicles needing removal required an endless number of flatbed trucks. To deal with the walking wounded, police guided them to a makeshift triage where they would be assessed. However, some required cutting out of their cars. The more serious injured were stabilised before transport to hospital. In total, 69 people were sent for medical care, with the majority being discharged on the same or next day. Only one person was kept in for more than a few days. By 11.05am, all casualties were off the scene and miraculously, no one was killed. Even more amazingly, especially when looking at the aftermath pictures, was that the bridge was reopened at 5.30pm the same day. Aftermath Even though the bridge had very little damage, the cost was still into the millions of vehicle expenses and the cost of rescue and recovery work. The police looked to investigate what the cause of the crash was. Motorists were thought to be driving recklessly in thick fog. Although controversially, instead of criminal proceedings, Kent Police decided to go a more educational route by offering the opportunity for the offending drivers to attend a driver awareness course. But Highways UK also had some questions to answer. Right from its first day of operation, questions had been posed about the bridge's safety, with its lack of hard shoulder, steep incline, lack of lighting and no warning signs. The chief police constable called for a speed reduction along the bridge, something that still hasn't been done. Now where would you rate this disaster on my scale? And my legacy scale? I'm going to say around a 4 for the former and about a 6 for the latter, maybe less if you're not from the UK.